So I'm delighted today to welcome a wonderful musician, a wonderful conductor, Maestro Robert Moody, music director of the Memphis Symphony and the Arizona Music Fest. Thank you so much for making the time to meet with me and answer a few questions. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. So I'm going to start, you know, getting our feet wet just very, very um, naturally and ask you about your beginnings with music, how it all started, how was your path? Uh, with music, how how did it all happen for you to end up being the music director of the Memphis Symphony? Did you start from a very young age? What was the, the triggering point? Yeah, so it's it, it's funny. I, I, I as probably you've done. I think every uh, conductor will speak at you know Rotary clubs in various places, and you tell your story of how you got into music or how you became a conductor. And I, I think of some people that I that I know who come from such a strong classical music pedigree. I, I spent a lot of time working with Jamie Bernstein. I just can't imagine what it would be like to be growing up in the house of Leonard Bernstein or something. My story could not be more different than that. Um, I am a native of South Carolina. I was uh, born and raised in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, a good sized um, regional city in the South. The truth is my family, especially my mother's family, is all from a place called Possum Kingdom, South Carolina. I'm not making it up. It's real. It's a farm community that if, if you, it's not too far from Clemson University, for example. But uh, you can bet for sure there was no Bach, Beethoven, Mozart in Possum Kingdom, South Carolina. And my, my dad was a mechanical engineer and very smart man, but no music. My mom played old church, Southern, you know, church hymnody. My first memories are hearing her play, like bringing in the sheaves on the piano at our house, the old country hymns. So um, yeah, so no, no classical music. Uh, in the fourth grade, in the public school system, a uh, teacher came to our class, a strings teacher, and he made a, a demonstration on you know, string instruments, violin, viola, cello, bass, and wouldn't it be fun to play a string instrument? And if, if you sign your name on this list, you'll be in the strings class and three days a week, you'll, you know, have 45 minutes of string instruction. And I did not sign my name. I don't even really remember that event happening. What I remember is him coming back to the class, calling off the list of uh, kids who had signed up to go with him. And he called my name. And I had no idea why my name was on the list um, until a girl in my class, my fourth grade girlfriend, Sherry Bednar, she started laughing because she remembered she had written not her name, but my name down on the sign up sheet. <laughs> and, you know, I was I was nine years old and I didn't know how to explain any of that to a teacher. So I got up and went to the class. And I mean, truly, here I am. I mean, that's sort of how it how it began. Um, she I changed found that, your life single handedly. <laughs> I mean, it really did. I, I knew I knew there was music in my system, I guess. I mean, I was I was um, even in first grade, I was getting all the solos in the church Christmas pageants and things like that. And I, you know, I had a sense that I could sing. And um, but really, it, it was that that fourth grade experience. And I, I chose the cello and the cello is my instrument to this day. I, I will tell you, I've practiced more cello in the last nine months than in the last 25 years. I have more calluses and good chops at my instrument than I've had in decades, um, uh, unfortunately, but thanks to COVID. But uh, I fell in love with the instrument and I knew I had an aptitude for it. And um, it, I was very lucky, Greenville, South Carolina uh, was a very early school district going back to the early 70s to have a public high school for the arts. And so I went to the Fine Arts Center, the Greenville County High School for the Arts, and I was studying voice and cello and music theory and music history. And, you know, it was um, it was actually about my junior year of high school. Um, I had a voice teacher who would start to say to me, you know, you could get college scholarships as a baritone. I mean, you could do this. You could make a career of this. But you're spending much too much time practicing the cello. You have to focus on your singing. And I had a cello teacher saying, you know, we could get you college scholarships. You could you could make a career out of this, but you got to stop singing. I need you to focus on the cello. <laughs> and um, honestly, this was a great, you know, dilemma in my 16, 17 year old life. Um, it was at that moment that 
uh, we took a field trip and I, all I recall is the teacher saying, um, the Chicago Symphony is coming to Greenville and they're going to be playing. They're doing a tour and they're going to play and here's the slip permission slip, get your parents to sign it. We are getting tickets and we're going. And not from a classical music family. I, I clearly remember thinking, oh, Chicago, well, Greenville has a symphony. So yeah, sure. Of course, Chicago's got one. Never, never thought of it, but sure they do. And uh, getting to the concert, they were playing Mahler One and George Schulte was conducting. And I remember looking at the program and thinking, Sol, Ty, Sol, I, I don't know who he is, I'm sure he's as good as my Greenville Symphony conductor that I've seen do, you know, youth concerts. And uh, by the end of the concert, by the end of the symphony and the horns are standing and playing the finale, I was in tears. I was crying. I'd never been so moved in my life. And I still can recall that feeling as I even tell you the story. And I, I looked at Maestro Schulte and I, you know, from the balcony and I thought, I want to try that. That's really, wow. that's interesting. And I became pretty laser focused from then on. And that was my answer to that dilemma. How can I, do I focus on vocal music or instrumental music? And I found the, the, the sort of the synergy in conducting. And I, all through college, uh, undergrad, I, I, I had a voice degree and a cello secondary degree, but I was just trying to conduct. Student conducting the opera and the orchestra and the chorus and and that that was at Furman University in South Carolina and then that got me to the Eastman School where I studied uh, conducting with Donald Newen and you know I've just sort of been as I think all conductors do you just sort of try and make your path um, you know sort of day by day especially in the beginning and um, anyway there you go that's fascinating too long of a story just, but that's how it got started it just really highlights uh, how important these tours are for these world-class orchestras to come and you know you know musicians are on the stage and they're playing maybe 20 times the the program in different cities around the world around the country and it's so important to remember how this can have an impact in every community they visit and how somebody like you you know suddenly realized this is what I want to do this is uh, I had a, a similar experience also when I was a kid in my hometown I didn't have much exposure there was a local symphony uh, which is the first orchestra i ever heard but also i remember the russian national orchestra coming into town when i was uh, uh, you know 12 13 and i yeah. just happened to go and i was blown away uh, it's those experiences that really mark you and it was the first time that i heard one of the one of the great orchestras and it was like wow this is and there was a a woman on the podium which i also found you know at that age you don't even think you know there were there, there were very barely any female conductors sure. Ver veronica dudarova i remember her um she seemed like this very uh, tiny tiny woman on the podium that makes such a huge Im impression on me but it, it's i think just so remarkable to think how these experiences can affect us and for us as as artists uh how we have this little you know responsibility that anything we do whether it's a recording a concert somewhere else a little tour a kids concert anything can have an impact on on the, on the people we have there and I think it's both both ends of the spectrum, if you will. It's it's a, a teenager getting to see uh, my social in Chicago. It's a nine year old kid somewhere who uh, chooses or is chosen to go into a string class. I mean, so much so much effect on uh, human lives that that a elementary school music teacher can have. It's it's huge importance. So following up on this, you've talked about your voice teacher, your cello teacher. Um, you mentioned your, your conducting teacher at Eastman. Um, in these experiences, um, how would you uh, describe these inspirational figures, your mentors? Uh, there must have been others as you started working as a conductor, as assistant conductor as well. Yeah, I, I, I you know, so I, I was a, we'll just mention Shelby one more time because I, I saw him twice later on. I, once I was, I was uh, sort of doing one of those summer I had done a, my my junior year abroad in Vienna, and I spent the summer after junior year of college, and I spent the summer after that just backpacking around with a friend, youth hostels and that sort of thing. And uh, Schulte was with Paris Orchestra doing Eroica in an outdoor concert, and and then I saw him at Carnegie Hall, uh, an auditor for one of those Schulte conducting seminars. And someone asked him at that 
event, they said, you know, what's the secret, Maestro? What is the secret of being a great conductor? And he, he said, to be a great conductor, one must be a great teacher. And to be a great teacher, one must be a great student. And I've interpreted that comment and thought about it ever since, but I've interpreted that to mean, um, look for the learning opportunity in, in every in every event in your life and every thing that happens in your life, look, look to it as a learning opportunity and look to the people who are older, more experienced, uh, et cetera, than you as, as teachers and mentors. So I, I feel like I could name really dozens of people that I could say would be great teachers and mentors. My, my conducting teachers from the very beginning, um, you know, the high school summer festival in, uh, South Carolina, a guy named Marion McGill, who had taught at Columbia University, to uh, Bing Vic, my teacher at Furman, Donald Newen. Donald Newen had been the assistant to Robert Shaw for years and years. And um, so at Eastman, I, I wanted to be Robert Shaw. I, I, I thought the combination of my voice and cello credentials would make me the perfect fit for choral conducting. And, and you know, I wanted when I say choral conducting, I wanted to spend a life of Verdi Requiem and Brahms Requiem and, you know, the great Elijah and, you know, B minor mass. I mean, that's really the kind of repertory that I was obsessed with in my early twenties and around that time. And uh, Don was the perfect person for me um, for that. And then I got out of grad school, um, did a little bit of time at an opera house in Austria in Linz, Austria, and um, not being a pianist, it's not as easy as I thought it would be to advance sort of upward through the ranks in the European opera system because I couldn't be a repetiteur. I, I couldn't play for the rehearsals and stagings. Um, so I came back to the States and like everyone sent out resumes right, left. And I was not really getting anywhere with choral work, but I was beginning to get hired for youth orchestras and then uh, a regional orchestra, the Evansville Philharmonic, my first professional job as the assistant conductor there and then the Phoenix Symphony and sort of on from there. Um, but at every place, the music director of the Evansville Philharmonic, Alfred Savia, one of the great, great music uh, minds in the country, uh, a great person to really learn sort of how to be efficient in rehearsal, how to score study. Kevin Mikael was my boss, the music director of the Phoenix Symphony. Maestro Mikael had as a young man, been assistant to Herbert von Karajan. So I really felt this wonderful kind of, you know, grandfather teacher experience learning what he had learned from von Karajan. Um, and then there's one other that, that I must mention, a, a woman, not a conductor, a woman named Nan Burt, who was a major patron of the Brevard Music Center. And she died in, in 2005 at age 106. Wow. And I knew her from age 90 until she died. I even at one point when I was a starving artist lived with her for about six months and worked in a deli when I had come back from Europe and was trying to find a job. And um, she really taught me a lot about humility. She was she had been an Eastman student in the 1920s. Wow. So I really learned a great amount from her about the, the aspect of this profession, which I think is much more about service and less about self. And that was not an easy lesson for me. I was, you know, not sure how you you felt at these moments, but I remember finishing Eastman and thinking, okay, I finished. I have my degree. Why has the Berlin Philharmonic not called me? Don't they have my number? And, you know, it's sort of, you spend a lot of time just sort of, look, Ma, look at me. Look, world, look what I just did. And I really, I think maybe it's a lifelong pursuit to change your thinking, but it's, she was a major force to help me realize that, the job is to, and the calling is to make the greatest, inspire the greatest music making that one can, which usually has very little to do with, with placing the focus on your gyrations or lack thereof on a podium. I love what you said about service, not self, and, and you know, gaining this perspective and the humility it requires to think that way and to feel that way. Um, I think we've all been fortunate to have people like this in our lives, uh, sometimes musicians, sometimes not, like this wonderful woman who really, um, you know, left s such a mark in, in, in you. So following up on this, I'd like to ask you about um, 
your position as a music director in the U.S. of two very important organizations, your leadership roles with the Memphis Symphony, the Arizona Music Fest, uh, and, and with the many previous positions you've held. Uh, what are some of the things you love the most about the responsibilities that come with these positions? Yeah, it's a good, great question. I, there are, to my way of thinking, there are two distinct um, jobs and that I'm in, that I'm involved with. One is conductor, the other is music director. And there are there are a number of people who um, certainly can do only one of those. There are a number of people who have had phenomenal careers being really only a conductor. So if you if you're a conductor and you're not tied to one specific orchestra or opera house or what have you, um, you know your 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 job as a conductor is probably what most all of us spend you know our fantasy time thinking about, and that's how can we get the very most out of you know resurrection symphony how can we say something how can we find our own musical commentary on sibelius five and 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 um and that's a fantastic that's the most phenomenal thing to do that the music director part is a very different um set of i think um criteria and 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 priorities in in, in this case now you're not just thinking about Beethoven on the on the stage are thinking about how is the orchestra going to be successful this year in five years in 10 years 50 years after you're gone how is music still going to be affecting the community and for every city for every region that's a different and a nuanced conversation and um it, it, I, I think it really a lot of similar practices happen from Chicago Symphony down to the smallest regional orchestra, but then there are places where maybe the scale is is different depending on the city. And yes, the size of the orchestra and the budget of the orchestra and the ability to do X number of concerts. But so I think you have to you have to become in one level the music mayor of the city, the key ambassador uh, for the importance of live music. You know, we don't have Esterhazy's, and you know. Lokovitz's, we don't have these folks, pay, you know, just sort of writing checks to us typically. So we have to create the 21st century version of that. As a music director, I ask on a fairly daily basis, how are we, what are we doing? How are we being successful at being the best 21st century orchestra, you know, relevant to our times? And that's very different than being an orchestra of, you know, 19. 1950 with you know Fort Wangler or something I mean this is a it's a very different set of issues that we um, deal with something's better some things worse than than 100 years ago or 50 years ago um, the Memphis Symphony Orchestra is just uh, the most wonderful organization to work for um, it's an orchestra that has like many of sort of that tier of major American orchestra in a, in a good good sized city has been through its share of ups and downs. You think of a lot of, you know, I could, I'm loath to name them, but you know, cities like Denver or Charlotte or Phoenix or Fort Worth or places where there's a great value place in the arts, there's a large population, but there isn't the historic background of Boston. And there also isn't necessarily the multi hundred million dollar endowment of Boston. And so you, so you, 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 you spend your energy and those orchestras have been through ups and downs financially. Um, Memphis was at a real low seven, eight years ago. There were moments where they were close to closing their doors. Um, I can very proudly tell you that in 2017, we had a Memphis had an endowment of that much. We now have a $25 million endowment wow. and some key people in the region chose to step up and, and decided that live orchestral music was really important. Um, and also we committed ourselves to, to really being as, as um, best purveyors of all types of music as we can. We want to never give up the, the, the central body of the repertory but we're Memphis. We're the city of Delta blues and rock and roll. This is where Elvis first walked into a building and recorded and Stax Records and the birthplace of Aretha Franklin and the 
the city in which Dr. King was assassinated. And that weighs heavily on the culture and the way we respond to um, race, racial issues, African-American issues, equity, diversity. So those kind of things occupy my life, both music making and community building in Memphis, whereas in Arizona with my festival out there, that's, I mean, I'm like the luckiest guy in the world. I, this orchestra joins for about nine days every February. And I, you know, the last time we joined, I had the concertmaster of the Philadelphia Orchestra as concertmaster and associate concertmaster of Atlanta sitting beside him and the principal uh, second of Cleveland Orchestra and principal viola of San Francisco Symphony and principal cello from Chicago Symphony. And, you know, Ricardo Morales is sitting there playing principal clarinet for me from Philadelphia. And, and on, Chris Martin is sitting playing principal trumpet from New York. So it's, you know, it's, you're it's it's like driving a ferrari la I mean, creme de la creme it's the creme de la creme and the the, uh, the best comparison i can make although we we're a much smaller much shorter version we just do four concerts in nine days but it's it's almost like you know i went once to lucerne festival orchestra that just that sense that like these greatest players in mostly north america are, i've come together and they're great people they're in a good mood it's Scottsdale, Arizona in February. It's not four below like it is in Chicago. And it, um, it's, it's really just a, a very joyful event. And we have, that, that organization has a lot of the same mission that I just described to you from Memphis, but specific to the Southwest and specific to the needs there. But there's also a Phoenix Symphony there. So we, we, we take care of our place in relationship and collaboration with that organization. That's a lot of talking for me, and I apologize to say that music no, no, director no. and conductor two, two very stuff. important but different things that you have to find the right sort of balance as you weave through it. Definitely, and so that that segues mm -hmm. perfectly onto my next question, which is your work as a guest conductor. You've also conducted in many places, and how do you see this difference? I mean, obviously, you don't have any of the responsibilities of the music director. It's the musical side of things, but there are also other challenges and. Uh, what are some, you know, some of those that you have encountered, you know, the very first time you're in front of a group, you don't know the sound, the kind of response, the group dynamics. Uh, what are some of these effective rehearsal techniques or, or dynamics that you've encountered over the years that help with experiences like that? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the, the first reaction that comes to mind when you ask the question is that I, I, I think I have, I think we all learn. I'm, I'm 53. I'll be 54 in a couple of months. And so my first job conducting was in 1990, uh, assistant uh, chorus master at the Brevard Music Center for their opera programs. So 30, little over 30 years now of doing this consistently full time. And um, I, I think we all learn as time goes, back to that comment about more about service and less about self. I think when you're in front of a new group, it's typical for the nerves to be at a more heightened level. You don't know them. They don't know you. You're, you know, you don't know the acoustics of the hall. You, you don't, you don't know, you know, if there's going to be sort of one of those typical stereotypical infamous curmudgeons in the wind section or the string section, and they're going to, you know, you, and, and those kind of considerations were probably occupying much too much of my thought process in the early days of guest conducting, early days of conducting, but it, it kind of was amplified, I think, when you're, you know, only one week with an, or with an orchestra. And the older we get, the more we do it, the more you, I say this with great love and great admiration and respect, don't care what the people think. And it's important, I think, for a conductor not to not to try and be second guessing what the look from the eye was of the trumpet player of the flute player you don't know them i mean you, we we most likely don't know each other and never met and the and when you're young i found that i would i would interpret the eye roll to mean he hates me he thinks i'm a charlatan it's over i'm i'm you know i'm now i think i don't know what he did but you know, let's let's play this tempo, please. Let's let's do it again. And it was don't make it don't make it sharp this time. Wh whatever it is, we're going to do. And 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 um, so I think I think you learn to you learn what to the things on which you should be focusing. 
what is the sound? How is the phrasing? How is the ensemble? Uh, wh what is, what, what really the concept of, that, that I have of a piece, how, how close is it, the thing I just heard, how close is it to the ideal that I have rolling around in my head for what I hope it's going to sound like? And if the, if the room doesn't respond the way I would have hoped, that means, I mean, I'm that quite often altering what I'm going to emphasize. If, if it's a bass heavy room or if it's not, I, it will alter the way I will try and show what, what's going on. And then the, you, I just thought of the very final thing is that I, even though I'm doing a mammoth amount of talking right now, I talk easily 60, to 70% less now uh, on a podium than I did 15 years ago. I, I talk as little as possible. And if, if anything, I will do my best. If we have to, if we go back, I'll say, let's go back to letter B. Everyone just, you know, I, I don't even feel like I need to say, watch me anymore. Just, I know how to get their attention. I know how to get the person's attention that I need to, to alter the thing that maybe I think could be better from the prior time. Wonderful, wonderful experience. Huh? What what it gives you? <laughs> it is, and and you know, for a full circle story, I've I've only I've stood in front of Chicago twice. Uh, once was a new music concert, once at Ravinia. But we did the Planets at Ravinia, and you know, to be to be standing there, um, doing Jupiter. I mean, listening to that sound uh, of Mars or Jupiter. Uh, and just remembering that being a 16 year old kid hearing, I mean, I think Charlie Vernon was the bass trombone when I heard Mahler one and there he was playing now, you know, for me, that's, that, that certainly was one of the personal sort of full circle, great moments of my life. Wow. Wow. Fascinating. So, and, and, and in a somewhat related topic, um, let's, let's uh, discuss about collaborations with soloists and what's important about this relationship. There are certain power dynamics, decisions to be made, how are, are there some experiences you were particularly fond of or that you thought, oh, this could have gone differently? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I believe so wholeheartedly in collaboration and in a, in a joint music making process. And I even think, obviously, conductor must show up to, um, you know, every event, every piece of music with his or her vision of the piece. Um, but I even when it's not a concerto, even when it's an orchestral work, I'm I'm very cognizant not to walk in that this vision is dictatorial, this vision I have in my mind. Um, if, if I were to hear something in an orchestral work and I think, well, I wasn't expecting the solo to go that way, but man, that bit of rubato was fantastic. I sold this, this because it, then it's a collaborative process. It's not just, it's not... Moody's vision, you know, or it's Bernstein's vision. It's really Moody's vision and the Memphis Symphony together. For soloists, I'm always looking for the human being whose whose personality and whose kind of giving skills, the the skills of of giving their music as opposed to protecting their music becomes very important to me. And I look for those people and and try to work with them again and again. We, of, of course, I've had some less than wonderful experiences. And usually that's when it's, you know, we've never worked together before because often if we've never worked together before and it doesn't go well, good chance maybe we won't work together again. And that's, that's typically if someone is sort of not communicative and they're not sharing with the eyes and the breath and they're, you know, they're not, if, if, if we're in rehearsal and something isn't the tempo or the rubato that they want, they sort of seem to shut down. And I bring out that negative to say that I, I find that to be a, the small percentage of the, of the person that I've had the chance to work with. That, that most people really want the end product to be, you know, the very best it can be. And I, I try and learn, I try and learn the soloist's language and um, I mean, you, Conrad Tao and Yuja Wang and Andrew Van Oyen and Orion Weiss are all pianists I love dearly and have all had a really great time conducting and doing concertos with. Every one of them speaks a different language. And by that, I mean, 
the way they use their body to communicate what they're doing and what they're going to do, the way they use their eye and their breath and their, and so I try and learn their language and, and, and I also try and defer very much to their vision. At the end of the day, I'll probably defer to my vision for a Beethoven symphony, but to their vision for a Rachmaninoff third piano concerto, because I, I want to be their best wingman is not the right word, but I want to be their best support system that I that I can be. And I, I certainly can't play Rachmaninoff piano concerto. So I, I'm going to presume they have a much greater level of expertise about about how it works for the piano than I do. If that makes sense. That's a wonderful answer. So now there is another type of collaboration I'd like to ask you about, and this is the role of new music, contemporary music within the, you know, as vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the core repertoire, working with living composers. Uh, what are some of your favorite experiences? And I know you've been a strong supporter of Mason Bates, for example. So yeah. Can, yeah. can you tell us, you have some scores there or photos? Uh, I was, I just, I, one of the things that somebody, this is, this is me and Mason when I think Mason was like 17 here and I was wow. like 27. Uh, we did a like a cross country, like backpacking across the country, drove from California back to the East Coast. Um, and uh, with the California Allstate um, that I'm doing virtually, um, since we had to narrow it down to just one small piece, we were originally going to do pictures, but now with California Allstate, we're doing Mason's uh, Desert Transport. So if people don't know it, I would highly recommend phenomenal 12, 13 minute work incorporates Salt River Pima Native American chant in the middle of it. Just really cool piece. I, I think I have, I'm told I have somewhat of a reputation for being an out of the box programmer. And I'm very proud of that, if that is indeed the reputation. Um, because I, I want to look for the unexpected relationships, least interesting to me. And this is maybe because I didn't grow up in sort of that classical family that we had discussed. Least interesting to me is a, is a concert that is connected only by key relationships. I mean, I, I know, I, I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying that for me, the key relationship between the overture and the, and the concerto have much less to do than other things and the other things can be the story they were meant to convey it can be um how maybe a piece even not planned by the composer has become to be known in culture whether that's pop culture through movies and entertainment or whether it's through historical culture through beethoven 9 being used at the end of wars and things like that um and then and then deciding like duke ellington said that there are only two types of music good and bad and that exists in music of the 18th, 19th, 20th century and today. And um, so I, I try and discover music that I believe to be truly outstanding, exceptional, and then pair them together. So if you, Chris, so Mason Bates is one of my closest friends and has been since he was a teenager and me in my mid 20s. So I will, I will always, you know, be probably first and foremost, most proud of my friendship with him and of him just, I can't believe this kid, you know, that I knew from a high school in Virginia, uh, who's turned out to be like one of the most well-known and respected and award-winning composers alive. Um, others who I think are right up there. I'm a huge fan of Chris Theophanides. Um, I, um, love Michael Gandolfi. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to sort of avoid saying, you know, Glass and Adams and those, but, um, I, I try and find just a, a smaller number of living composers and do their works multiple times over and over and over. So I, you know, I keep, I keep programming a lot of Theophanides, of course, a lot of Bates, a lot of Michael Gandolfi, a lot of, you know, and, and I try and put them in into, oh gosh, I try and put them into interesting, I dropped the picture. I try and put them into interesting contexts. Um, here's a good one with Memphis. Last year, we put together um, L'Histoire de Soldat and blues of Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson was the Delta blues man who famously met the devil at the crossroads, which is the crossroads is about oh, 50 miles from Memphis in Mississippi. And we actually merged the two. I made the narrator for the soldier's tale sort of be Robert Johnson's. Robert Johnson, we had this great blues artist 
who narrated the story. We, we updated the language in English to, to be more sort of Robert Johnson-esque. Uh, but we had the soldier and the devil and the, the princess and everything, all the music of Stravinsky, but in between uh, segments of the Stravinsky came also Robert Johnson blues. I'm, I'm, we, we made a video of it. We'll, we'll make it, we're starting soon to make it more mass available, but I'm so proud of that um, concept. And I, it applies to the way we put together Mason Bates, you know, cello concerto uh, with Enigma variations and something like that. I mean, there are so many interesting combinations, I think, with, where music can can speak to society, speak to history, speak to cultural events uh, and, and without taking sides, but instead trying to get the message across that music can heal. Even if you are furious at each other for political or religious or other reasons, music can be this, I believe, this healing property. And I think live music can be that. So I try to program accordingly. And that's where a lot of the great new music comes in. And I have a completely related follow-up question about uh, what your take on what the role of music is nowadays, and especially if there is anything it would change in the so-called music business. There is so much with uh, social justice movements these days going on, and and a call for you know more diversity, equity, inclusion. Well, how would you describe what music means? Yeah, I, I, th I what I think music can do. And I, I'm slightly smirking because I realize how it sounds, but I believe it nonetheless. I think music changes lives. I mean, I think music more than any other factor has the ability to change lives and change a community. Um, I, I, um, I, 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 I know that religion does not bring people together. That's patently obvious. I know that politics does not bring people together. We are in maybe the most cartoonish uh, version of that story right now that we've been in my lifetime, where the it's it's become almost like a like a bad TV show. The political angst and anger from one side to the other. Um, I, I people people will find m multiple reasons to. Uh, disrespect or hate each other because of your color or your gender or your orientation or your religion or, or, or. And I do think music, I keep plodding along one, one person at a time, one concert at a time, thinking that music can sort of uh, affect that. Um, Memphis, Tennessee, I, I mentioned before, we are the city where Dr. King was assassinated. That, that event changed that city. And it's been 53 years coming up now since that happened, but it changed that city. And it, it made everyone ask incredibly difficult questions of each other and of themselves. And half century later, Memphis is, I think, well ahead of a lot of places in the country because they had to ask those difficult questions and still also has a lot of work to do. The orchestra can have an effect on that. The orchestra can, can be part and parcel of that. And that goes so far beyond playing a work by an African American composer in February. That would that's the sort of silliest thing you, the most tokenism thing that could possibly be done. We've um, we've had more focus on this um, in the last three years than maybe the prior few decades, and we've had more focus on it since this past June, since the killing of George Floyd. Um, and I think most orchestras, I think most arts organizations are talking about these concepts more and thank God. And, you know, we, we, we made a commitment in Memphis where, where there was a work on every program that we're doing this spring, all of next season, we'll be announcing the season in a few weeks. Every program has a work, most every program by an African-American composer or if not a, a Latino composer, or if not a, pr a prominent African-American Latino, uh, Latinx um, conductor, soloist, something. It's, it's, become, it's become, become something that we as a body have decided is important for Memphis to do. Memphis Symphony Orchestra should look and play 
more like the entire community of Memphis. And we're, we have miles to go. We are joined by orchestras around the country who have miles to go in this direction. Um, but we are, we are, we are digging into that more aggressively as aggressively of maybe more than almost any orchestra in the country right now. And, and we feel a, we feel a responsibility to it because of the makeup of our city, the history of our city. And, um, you know, I, I've said my assistant conductor is, is, uh, she, I, I've, I've said that Kalina Boval is the most, the most prominent, most uh, famous African American, Latina American female conductor in the world. She also, maybe the only African Latina, you know, her parents are from Panama. She was raised in California she's African American. She, and um, we have a, keep your eye on her because, because this is a, an amazing talent. I, I just hope we can keep her for as long as possible, but we have a lot of conversations about this. And I, I say to her, I, I, I will, I will mention the elephant in the room. I'm quite aware that I'm a middle-aged white guy having these conversations. And the last thing I want to do in this conversation about equity, diversity, inclusion in the arts is to be the head of the table, is to be the key seat at the table. I'd like to listen, mostly listen, can, but really pay attention to my fantastic colleagues who um, have lived a very different life than me. My life was different than Jamie Bernstein or Michael Stern, but stories I told, but there's no way I can compare that to the life of an African-American player or conductor making it or trying to make it as a young player or, or conductor in this business. And uh, so I, it's cheesy, isn't it? Music changes lives, music can heal, but the truth is it's also quite true. And we can use this language to do it where other avenues probably don't have a chance and we have a chance. I think it's, it could definitely be seen perceived as cheesy when it's just a phrase, empty words and no, no action. But clearly what you're telling me talks a lot more about how the orchestra fits within the fabric of its community and, and the type of conversations that are being had and, and, and clear actions that are, are being being taken to, to change things. So it, it's absolutely not cliche in any way. <laughs> yeah, that, that's our hope. I mean, the, the hope is to always, you know, Peter, Peter Abel is our CEO in Memphis and I'm, I'm such a huge fan, He's per perfect um, partner in crime to work with. And you know, many times when Peter and I are just talking and plotting and scheming, we kind of say, you know, we don't need to have another series of 19 meetings. We just need to do X, Y, and Z. And as best we can, we do X, Y, and Z and just take care of things to move us forward. And I think a lot of orchestras are doing that. I'm seeing a lot of strength in this happening with organizations around the country, as it should be. Yeah. So I'll go back a little bit to a topic we touched a little <laughs> earlier, which was about your role as a programmer. And I'd like to ask you, about certain areas of the repertoire, certain corners that you might not have explored so much of yet, or certain works, something that can, might come to mind to you to think, oh, I really want to conduct this piece. I haven't done it yet. I haven't ha found the right opportunity. Um, anything that comes to mind. Yeah, well, so so Donald Nguyen, my, my uh, teacher, and again, I was sort of moving down the path of like trying to be Robert Shaw when I was 21. Um, Mr. Nguyen would say, don't even think about conducting the Brahms Requiem until you're 40 years old. Don't even ponder the St. Matthew Passion until you're 50 years old. And don't even touch the B minor Mass until you're 60 years old. I, I will say I waited until I was 40 to conduct the, um, the Brahms Requiem. Now I've done it a number of times and I, and I appreciate the comment. Um, <clears throat> I still haven't done St. Matthew. I've done St. John Passion a number of times. And in the larger body of work, um, you know, I mean, I'm, oh, I won't turn the camera live. I, you know, this is, I'm in my, my library. They're my, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. my study and they're my scores. And I've, I don't know, I should count up probably a few thousand scores. And I go back and forth these days between wanting to do the piece I haven't done. I made a confession the other day. I've, I've never done Chike Six. It's such a great piece and I don't know how it hasn't rolled across my plate. I've done two, three, four, five, un countless times. Never done six. So you 
probably going to see it programmed by the Memphis Symphony in the upcoming <laughs> seasons. But I, I go back and forth between wanting to take on that work, whether it's a brand new work, or it's a work that somehow just hasn't made it across my plate for various reasons, wanting to take on that work and dig in and learn it and wanting to, you know, take pass number 23 at, you know, pastoral symphony, because I, I feel I feel finally like I'm starting to figure it out, you know, after I, I think if, if anyone from the Phoenix Symphony ever were to look at this, I think they would they would relate to this comment. I sometimes want to apologize to those players. I was resident conductor there for eight years and I got my feet wet. You you named the repertory. I did it for the first time with them. All the Brahms symphonies, most of the Beethoven symphonies, Dvorak six, seven, eight, nine, on and on. And I sometimes pull the score out when I'm doing it now and look back and think, gosh, how did those people put up with me? Just, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what the heck I was doing going through that piece the first time. And maybe I'm hard on myself, but that's, you know, I, so, so I, I there's a, I'm trying, I try and find a good, good balance. I, I won't, um, I don't need to anymore. So I won't do a program with more than one work on it which is new for me anymore i spent plenty of time in my life where all three all overture concerto symphony were all new works and i was cramming and what have you so now you know i find that it's it's not it's not that it's better for me it's better for the orchestra and it's better for the audience and it's better for the music you know i i wouldn't and i would say specifically with the with guest conducting i'm I've gotten much more bold to say, no, I won't do that piece. And, and, and if I don't say it to that orchestra, I might say it to my agent, I'll say, yeah, trust me, they don't want me doing this piece. I mean, I, I'm not, I would rather do this piece because I'll, I will bring much more to the table and we'll have a much stronger experience. If they want this piece, then there are multiple conductors who, who conduct this genre of repertory or this specific work or this specific composer at a much higher level than I do. They just, they're much more to house with this, you know, at home with this type of music and I'm much more at home with this type of music. And so that's, that's a nice part of um, aging in this business as well. Uh, understanding the, the pacing and understanding what you're, what you're good at and what you're not. And, and every conductor would love for the world to think that, you know, we are the Funkarian of every single work that we touch, but I don't think any, not a human can say that. We all, you know, we all have our strengths and shall we say less than strengths in repertory. So. I think it speaks so highly of you and it goes back to what you mentioned earlier about service, uh, you know, not just doing it for the service to, to the music and, and not your, your own ego or uh, it's very, very important. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Following up on this, um, uh, I want to ask you about the pandemic and how it's affected your life, your everyday life. You know, so many concerts that as a performing musician must have been canceled, postponed. Uh, where have you been finding inspiration during these difficult times? Yeah, and, you know, talk, talk about something that no one saw coming. I was uh, last March 8, I think it was, March 8 or 9, I was sitting in Sacramento, California. I just landed flown across the country, had a nice week, um, Sasson Organ Symphony, big work with Sacramento Philharmonic. And I, when I got picked up at the airport, the person who picked me up, I said, so news seems to be getting worse about this coronavirus thing. Do you, do you think we're gonna have a concert this weekend? And he said, oh yeah, you know, it's there's some things going on in San Francisco, but I think we're fine. Nothing really bad here in Sacramento. That was six o'clock at night seven o'clock the next morning he called and said um we're gonna send you back to the east coast we've canceled the weekend <laughs> so so that's the last that's the last time that i was you know this close to actually conducting a normal orchestral concert um we with the memphis symphony like many orchestras we have done our fair share of virtual concerts we did you know william tell overture and um, pomp and circumstance at graduation time and a few things like that. And there's a, there's a great, there's something really creative about everyone in their own home, home in their living room playing their part for 
you know, William Tell, but we did that. We then uh, started a season in the fall. We did mostly outdoor concerts and with a greatly reduced orchestra, um, as, as few as 12 people, as many as 28 people, one, one string player per stand, everyone in a mess, all the brass and winds with a sort of nylon type covering on their bell, me conducting in a mask, and you know, the, the whole thing in it, it's better than nothing. Uh, uh, it's certainly better than nothing. And there were, there have been moments, you know, we did Prague symphony like that, Mozart. And wow. there are moments where great music certainly happened. Our principal clarinet on that all Mozart did, did the clarinet concerto. Some amazing music, but it's not the, not nearly the same as, as the standard product. We're doing similar concerts this spring. Um, we have a few more, we, we were able to have a few more people on stage and have a few more people in the audience. And we're, I think I've been tested 20 times now. Um, so it's changing. We're planning both in Arizona and in Memphis, we're planning for fairly normal seasons starting next fall. And we hope that that's right. I hope Dr. Fauci is right, that the vaccines are, and that the herd immunity will happen in time, but we're, we're planning for it. And then uh, in a, on a, just on a personal note, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've lost all my frequent flyer points that I usually accumulate every year. And, but, uh, my partner and I, um, have, he's put a garden in the backyard. I've never been a gardener before we've done that. I've cooked more in nine months than I have in 30 years. I've played the cello, as I said, more in nine months than I have in 30 years. I've, I've got the best calluses and the best chops I've had in a very long time. And, and I really think that's very helpful to me as a conductor. I've, I've retooled my thinking about what does it really feel like to be not the person on the podium, but the person sitting at the desk um, playing and, and how I, I, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how that it's affecting my score study and getting ready for you know, Beethoven eight. We were doing in a few weeks in, in, um, in Memphis, for example, um, or Appalachian spring we're doing in Arizona in late April. Um, and this is, you know, I've been playing through the parts, playing through the cello part of app spring, very helpful. I mean, incredibly helpful to, to my, to this process. I want it over. I'm sure you do. I want it over so badly. I want to be back with full orchestra and full chorus and full house and the great live music making. But, but I think we creative people have been able to probably navigate through this um, maybe better than the average bear, just because our life is about being creative and God knows we've had to be creative to get through this unprecedented time. Yeah, for sure. So you've been incredibly generous with, with your time. I'm looking, keeping an eye on the clock here. So oh, yeah, I'm sorry. going to come up with my last question. No, it's, been, it's been wonderful and so candid and so open. So I, I've really enjoyed everything. So in closing, my last question is about um, young people, young musicians, any advice you might have for them those who are starting off as musicians transitioning into the, the profession or wanting to become a composer, a conductor, an orchestra musician, what would be your advice for them? I tell, and I've, I've, I've worked um, at a lot. I, I was a youth orchestra conductor for 13 years, both in Evansville, Indiana and Phoenix, Arizona. And um, I've done a, so many wonderful all state orchestras around the country. And I've worked at Brevard Music Center, Sirwani Festival in the summer. Um, a lot of great summer festival conducting, um, and I, I will I will say what I've said many times to to students, the high school student, the college student, the grad student. First, it's gonna sound weird. If you can think of anything that you could do, which isn't music, that you would find satisfaction in life doing, do it. Make that your career. Absolutely, make that your career. I I I. I think the best thing to do is to try and engender a, a amazing love of music and an amazing understanding of the power of music. And also an understanding that um, some people I believe are, you, no one was gonna talk me out of doing this. No, no one was, was going to convince me to have a fallback degree in law or business. Or, no, it just wasn't going to happen for me. I was, you know, I was going to, I was going to do this, um, period. And I, and I think most 
most musicians who, who spend their life doing it have some level of that mindset. And, and it, so that's the first thing, because it's tough. Music profession is tough. We, we, we think, you think about the number of, of people who show up for an, an audition for an open seat in, in the Memphis Symphony, hundreds, you know? thousands who, who would like who would turn in their resume and try and get a seat in the Chicago Symphony one seat so you know it's a it's a tough profession and there's so many other aspects you don't have to play in an orchestra there's there's great education work and and you know university work and so many things to do but it's nonetheless it's tough and I would want the person to never be fooled and think it's you know just a, a trip through the roses it's it's a this is there's not a prescribed path as easy as there is in maybe certain other professions. And then I would next say, you know, visualize what you want to be, see it. This this goes back to Don Nguyen and my 105 year old friend Nan Burt. See who you see in your mind's eye, uh, who you who you would like to be, and who you imagine that you would like to be in five years and ten years. And go for it. And you know, I'm a I'm a very I'm a spiritual person. Nan, my friend, she was very fond of you know saying we we her voice, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And you know, that's her 90 year old voice. But I think about it all the time. So if you are, if you're not, it's fine. But if you're sort of a person who believes in God or the universe, then I invoke that. Maybe it's the spirit of music. I don't know, but I sort of invoke that greater sense of providence into it. But then go for it. And and you know, if if you if you're a conductor and you want to, you're living in Chicago, then go bug the heck out of people at Chicago Symphony and ask them if you can sit in the balcony and watch rehearsals. You know, just to, to find find ways to. That's one example of a million. Find ways to sort of move yourself into the fabric of the of the community that go beyond just, you know, getting ready for the three auditions you have next month. That's, of course, that's huge, but just make your whole life about being somehow imbued with music. And then you probably, if, if you can't think of anything else you want to do, and you've got that kind of passion, and you have that kind of vision, my experience is most people are going to be all right. Wow. Thank you very, very much. It's been wonderful to, to listen to all your ideas, your insight. I really enjoyed it. So uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, and, and let's hope that music can go back to normal very soon. I know. And I know I talked too much and I'm sorry for that, but it's been really great to, to talk to you. And it's really great to sort of share these concepts and ideas with you. So thank, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you it. so much.